Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, the first episode of Mingles with Jingles of 2018. Got a lot to talk about, not least of which, of course, Jingles, what's with the new intro music? What happened to the classic Mingles with Jingles theme tune? Yeah. Don't worry, I'm not in trouble before anybody starts getting worried about copyright strikes. Um, I haven't been hit with any copyright strikes. The music was composed by John Williams. It was the march from the Steven Spielberg movie 1941. Not a particularly popular Steven Spielberg movie, not a lot of people have seen it, but I absolutely loved it. And I loved the music, but it was copyrighted. And my YouTube partner network got a bit excited about it. And so, yeah. You might have noticed that certain episodes of Mingles with Jingles have been made private. That's because I'm basically going to have to go through over 200 Mingles with Jingles videos and trim the intro off just to make sure we're okay. So, massive pain in the arse, but, well, better safe than sorry. So, I, of course, had to do a new intro for Mingles with Jingles. I'm, I'm not going to say I hope you like it. Um, <laughs> because, well, I think the old music had just become so iconic and so associated with me. I think there are probably more people that associate that music with me now than with the actual Steven Spielberg movie that it came from. And, well, that can be very, very dangerous because it was copyrighted music and I really should never have been using it. But you can get away with that when you only have 500 subscribers. Well, you can usually get away with that when you only have 500 subscribers. When you have nearly 600,000, people tend to notice. So, rather safe than sorry, I'm going to have to go through, and it's going to be a long and very boring process of going through every episode of Mingles with Jingles and trimming that music off just to be on the safe side. In the meantime, I've done a new intro. Um, it'll do, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's never going to be as good as the old one. It just doesn't have the same music. But that's kind of the point. Um, a couple of other videos came to the attention of my partner network. Some very, very bizarre choices. I did a World of Warships video. Um, oh, I can't remember which one it was, but there was another one of the videos that's been made private because it used um, a rendition of the US Navy Academy's song, Anchors Away. It's also the fight song of the US Navy. It's a very, very popular tune. But it was written by the US Naval Academy's bandmaster before the First World War. Um, and it's basically federal property. It was done by US Naval Academy staff on US Navy Academy time. It belonged to the federal government. So I thought there's absolutely, you know, be fine. Well, it turns out that the version I was using just so happens to have been recorded by, believe it or not, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> and they've gone and copyrighted their own version of Anchors Away. I say their version of it, it's just them singing the song that belongs to the US Naval Academy. And apparently that's enough to be able to establish a copyright claim. I, I couldn't believe it, but apparently it's true. And it's just not worth messing around with. So I've had a couple of videos that have been made private. So, you know, they're not available to the general public because of, you know, frankly, bullshit reasons like this. But, well, you can't mess around with record companies. Record company executives, even movie executives, are embarrassed to be seen in the same room as record company executives. They're so greedy. So, better safe than sorry. I'm going to be devoting an hour a day for the next probably month or so to go through my video library and make all of my previous episodes of Mingles with Jingles safe and fit for public consumption again. Bit of a bummer, but hey. And I don't really want to start the new year off on a bummer because it has actually been a... So far, at least, I realise it's not that old. We're barely a week into it. Uh, it's been a pretty good new year. World of Warships, uh, you may be aware that I finally unlocked the USS Missouri, Tier 9 Premium US Navy battleship, 750,000 free XP. The reason I was in a rush to get it, well, there was a couple of reasons, mostly because they're removing it. It's not going to be available for much longer. I'm not entirely sure when it's being removed, but probably this month. They're replacing it with a new tier 9 premium battleship, the Musashi, which was the sister ship of the Yamato. And that's going to cost 920,000 free XP. The reason ships like this were put into the game um, was because, well, at the time the Missouri was introduced, there were players who'd been playing so much World of Warships that they'd stockpiled 
nearly a million free XP. And there were plenty of other players who didn't have that much in free XP, but had around about that much in experience locked on various different ships. So Wargaming thought, well, if we stick this in, one, it gives those players who do have three quarters of a million free XP something to spend it on, and it may encourage people to convert locked experience in free experience and use it to buy the Missouri. So it was a kind of win-win situation, really, for, uh, well, anybody who did have that amount of free XP and for Wargaming, because it provided some incentive for people to buy some gold and convert all of their locked experience into free experience. I think when they set the price at 750,000 free XP, they, they probably thought, well, there were always going to be a couple of players who just had that amount of free XP sitting around with nothing to spend it on and who were going to get the Missouri straight away. But in the vast majority of cases, most people were never realistically going to be able to accumulate that amount of free XP. I think it was always intended to be something that only a very small minority of players were ever realistically going to be able to unlock. I mean, if you are going to do it just with free experience, just from the free experience that you gain from playing, it was going to take months and months and months of dedicated playing hours every day to accumulate that amount of free XP. And even if you were going to convert locked experience on your elite ships to free experience by spending gold, it was going to cost something like over 100 euros to buy the amount of gold necessary to convert that experience. So I'm pretty sure Wargaming never felt that the Missouri was going to be an easily attainable goal. And for a lot of people it isn't an easily attainable goal. It's still way out of reach of most casual players. I mean, let's say you've been playing World of Warships for six months and you're grinding your way down the Soviet cruiser line and you've just unlocked the shawls, the Soviet Tier 7 cruisers. So you've bought the shawls and in the time that you've been playing World of Warships, you've accumulated 40,000, 50,000 free XP, and you haven't spent it on anything, but now you've got the shores in your harbour, but it's completely stock. Are you going to continue to stockpile that free experience? And because 50,000 is a reasonable chunk of the 750,000 required to get the Missouri, or are you going to start spending that free experience unlocking modules for the shores so that the first time you take it in battle, it isn't completely stock? And I think that's what most people have been using their free XP on. Um, it's something that's always recommended to do in World of Tanks as well. Never unlock a vehicle with free experience. Instead, grind out the tank using a fully upgraded tank of the previous tier and unlock the tank with experience earned on the tank before it and use your free experience to unlock the modules on your new tank so you're never going into battle with a stock tank. That's the way most people do it. So most people were never ever going to accumulate that amount of free experience. It was only really going to be the people who had already unlocked every ship in the game and were just stockpiling free experience every time they played with nothing to spend it on. But then of course they keep introducing new lines of ships into the game. French cruisers for example, British battleships. I had so much free experience stockpiled prior to the release of the British battleships that I was able to start playing the tier 8, the Monarch, on the day the British battleships were released. And I was getting into tier 10 games in the Monarch, and people were already playing the Conqueror, the tier 10. So there are definitely people who just have this amount of free experience sitting around. But these are still astronomical amounts of free experience that we're talking about here. I mean, I'm sure that anybody in the top clans, like Omni for example, they've already unlocked every ship in the game. They've already got the Missouri, they've already got the Nelson, which was I think 375,000 free experience. And, and they've already got the 920,000 required to unlock the Musashi the day that it's introduced. But I never really considered myself to be that, you know, in that same category of player. But given how easily I was able to get the free experience required to unlock the Monarch, which is a tier 8 battleship, on the day that it was released, I started to think, well, maybe the Missouri isn't quite as unobtainable as I had previously believed. And it became very, very obtainable, thanks to two developments. First was the PvE operations. The thing about the operations is the better you do with them, the greater the rewards, obviously. The more stars you complete the operations with, the more credits and experience you earn out of it. It's not all just based on how much damage you've done, as it is in PvP, for example. Um, credits and experience earned in PvP 
are a direct result of how much damage and how much spotting you do in PvP. Now you get that in Ops as well, but the number of stars that you complete the operation with acts as a sort of multiplier to the amount of credits and experience that you earn. So if you can consistently finish an operation with four or five stars, and the best way to do that is to division up, then you earn a lot of experience and credits. But here's the thing. Over Christmas, I opened a lot of those premium Santa gift boxes from World of Warships. A whole bunch of you gifted me some of them. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed for that. And I also bought a couple of packs myself. And I must have opened 60 or 70 of these boxes. And here's the thing. Inside those boxes, they can contain a number of things. They can contain a number of premium ships, premium camouflages, uh, consumables, gold, premium account time, and signal flags. And the signal flags that you got in those boxes were the special ones. Not the regular ones that you can earn just by playing the game. Although you can earn the special ones by playing the game as well. You get them as rewards from ranked battles for completing campaigns and so on and so on. But I'm talking about signal flags that do things like boost your free experience earned by 777%. So playing operations, particularly the tier 7 operations, with all these signal flags mounted, it was not unusual to finish an operation with five stars, earn 15,000 experience on the ship, and 10,000 free experience for each operation played, providing you completed it with five stars and did a reasonable amount of damage. That's a lot. Of course, you still have to pay gold to convert that free experience, except, well, actually, no, I didn't. Because inside all of these gift boxes, you get gold. And if you get a premium ship from the gift box, and you already have that premium ship, and I have nearly every premium ship available in the game, so almost every time I got a ship from opening one of these gift boxes, instead of the ship, I was getting the 10 point captain, which was very nice, and the gold value of that ship. So I must have made something like 150,000 gold just from opening these gift boxes. So I didn't actually have to pay any money to convert all of the free XP that I was earning because I was accumulating so much gold just from opening these Christmas Santa gift boxes. Now, I still wasn't in any particular rush to get the Missouri. I was just having a grand old time unlocking all of the tier seven ships that I was going to need in order to be able to play the new tier seven operations. But then they announced that they were removing the Missouri from the game. And of course that they were replacing it with the Masashi. Now, the Masashi is a strong ship. It had better be for 920,000 free XP. It's basically a Yamato, but with slightly nerfed guns. It's a tier nine premium battleship that has the Yamato's armor, it has the Yamato's health, and it does have the Yamato's 18 inch guns. It doesn't have the same anti-aircraft firepower as the Yamato, however, and the accuracy of the guns, the Sigma value of the guns isn't as good as on the Yamato. And the thing about the Yamato, the only thing about the Yamato that prevents it from being the worst tier 10 battleship in the game is its guns. Two things about those guns. The fact that they are sufficiently high caliber to be able to overmatch the bow and stern armor of any other battleship in the game, including itself. And also the fact that they are actually reasonably accurate. And if you nerf the Sigma value, well, the Masashi becomes a little less special. It's still good because it's tier 9, not tier 10. It's got the Yamato's health and the Yamato's armor and the ability to overmatch the bows of any other battleship in the game. But it's not as good as the Yamato. And it shouldn't be as good at the Yam as the Yamato because it's tier 9, not tier 10. But here's the thing. For 920,000 free XP, if you want a Yamato, just get the Yamato. <laughs> I mean, if you've got that much free XP accumulated, get the Yamato. The Missouri, however, well, it's an Iowa, but it's not a nerfed Iowa in the way that the Masashi is a nerfed Yamato. It actually has access to radar, which is something that the Iowa doesn't. It's got ridiculously strong AA. Um, if you're in the Iowa, no, sorry, not the Iowa, if you're in the Missouri, for example, and there's a tier 7 carrier on the enemy team, you, you don't even need to pay attention to his aircraft. <laughs> right? It's just... They can't hurt you. Uh, the AA is ridiculously strong. Great guns. Um, depending on the modules that you fit, you can either have the highest DPM, 
of any tier 9 battleship in the game, or you can have at medium range, 12 kilometers or less, the most accurate guns of any tier 9 battleship in the game. You know, it's fairly unique, despite the fact that it is just another Iowa-class battleship. So I thought, yeah, this is doable. And it was entirely doable, because I was earning 50,000 experience an hour. So, you know, <laughs> it's not going to take that long. It's not going to take the months and months and months that I think the Missouri was supposed to take, thanks to Tier 7 operations, thanks to all of those special signal flags, premium account time, and all of the gold that I had managed to unlock from opening those Christmas Santa boxes. It was going to take days rather than months. Um, and so I thought, well, what the hell? Why not? And so I did it. In fact, I, I live-streamed the last 160,000 experience, and it took three hours. <laughs> I did uh, divisions with subscribers, uh, and we all joined up into a division, and we played the mostly the Tier 7. Um, this operation in particular, the new one, Operation Narai. This thing, in something like the Atlanta, or the Flint, or the Belfast, is just a license to print credits and experience. And you don't have to be grinding out the Missouri. I mean, I've just unlocked the North Carolina, the American Tier 8 battleship. And the North Carolina is a fantastic Tier 8 battleship. But I would only have to play for an hour and a half. <laughs> Doing this. To unlock the Iowa, the Tier 9. I, I'm, I really don't think Wargaming realised just how fast your rate of progression through the tech tree can be if you're running these operations in a division of seven players. That's the trick, by the way. You must have a division of seven players. You can queue solo or in a division of two or three for whatever the operation of the week happens to be. But if you have a division of... Well, actually, you can do it with a division of five, but I don't recommend doing them with five players. Six or seven, you know, fill the division up, get all seven players in. And once you have that number of players in the division, you can pick any operation that you want. You don't have to do the Operation of the Week. And since this one, Operation the Rye, is such a ridiculous credit and experience grinder, well, why the hell not? It doesn't really matter what you're grinding for, whether it's the Missouri or just the next ship in whichever line you're currently enjoying. I had no great desire to get the Pan-Asian Destroyers, for example. But then I realised, well, if I have the Tier 6 Pan-Asian Destroyer, that's another ship I can use to grind the operations out. <laughs> so, even before I decided I was going to get the Missouri, um, I'd unlocked, with free experience, all of the Pan-Asian Destroyers, up to and including the Tier 6. And then, of course, they announced the Tier 7 operations. I thought, well, there's a whole bunch of Tier 7 ships that I don't already have as well. So I got the Tier 7 Pan-Asian Destroyer. I didn't have any of the German destroyers, aside from the V-25, the Tier 2. Well, now I have the Tier 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, all done with free experience, even before I decided that I had to accumulate 750,000 for the Missouri. I've got all of the French cruisers, up to and including the Tier 8, the Charles Martel. I actually went one further than I needed to because I had a premium camouflage for the Charles Martel unlocked. I can't remember how I got it. It was some kind of mission or operation, but I didn't have the Charles Martel, so I thought, oh, what the hell. I'll drop another 70 or 80,000 or however much it is um, and got myself the Charles Martel. I don't think I've even played it yet. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> but that's how easy it is to gain ridiculous amounts of experience just by grinding out these operations. I really don't think Wargaming realised just how easy they were making it with the combination of Tier 7 operations and the special signal flags that you can get from not just opening these Santa gift boxes, but also from completing various different campaigns and playing ranked battles. Suddenly that 920,000 free experience for the Masashi, it, it doesn't seem like a long-term goal anymore, does it? I mean, these ships are intended to be the Missouri and the Masashi, and to a lesser degree the Nelson as well even though it was only 375,000 free XP because it's tier 7, not tier 9. But these ships aren't supposed to be something that you're really supposed to just go out and get. <laughs> They're supposed to be something there as long-term goals. Something that, you know, once you've gotten everything else that you want, it's something for you to aim towards, something that you can start to stockpile your free XP on. 
they're not supposed to be something you can just go, well, let's see, 920,000 free XP, 50,000 XP per hour, I can do that in 18 and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. Look at this one, 267,000 damage done. This one wasn't in a division. Um, this one was just me playing in a random bunch of teammates. 267,000 damage, and we still have five of the team left alive. Now, you could certainly accuse me of having gone unnecessarily balls deep in the Geniser now there, but at the point where I decided to go for it, I thought, well, there's still, even if I die, there's five of us left alive. I've done 267,000 damage, I'll charge in there, sink as many as I can, and surely the other five ships on the team can deal with this one. That's the final reinforcement wave. There are no more enemy ships in this operation. Sink them, and you've won. You'd think the five ships remaining on my team would be able to handle them, and you'd be wrong. <laughs> the lesson here is it doesn't matter how well you think things are going when you're playing one of these operations. If you're still alive, stay alive. Don't throw your ship away. Even if it seems like a good idea at the time, never underestimate the ability of a team of random players to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. So, World of Warships, that's basically what I've been spending most of my time on during my two-week break over Christmas, and a lot of fun it has been. What I thought I'd do now was I would, and this is something that I haven't done in an episode of Mingles with Jingles for a very, very long time, and I really should do more, is have a look at some of the messages that you guys have sent me while I was taking my two weeks off over Christmas. A whole bunch of you, no one person in particular, had sent me messages asking me to do a video on the Predator mini-event in Ghost Recon Wildlands. For those of you who have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands introduced a very small special event over Christmas, which was a tie into the Predator movies, and it makes perfect sense when you think about it, because the Predator, well, the first Predator movie at least, the one starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, involved a small special forces team inserted into the jungles of South America on a CIA-backed operation who ended up being hunted down by this alien predator. And Ghost Recon Wildlands features a small special forces team inserted into the jungles of South America on a CIA-backed operation. Uh, you know, there's, there are certain similarities here, so the whole idea of, of doing a predator event in Ghost Recon Wildlands seemed like such an obvious no-brainer. Unfortunately, I did try to do a video on it, I certainly played it, but it, it was a case of the build-up to it was far, far better than the actual execution of the Predator mission itself. The way it worked was that a new mission would pop up if you were playing Ghost Recon uh, while the event was active, and you'd get a mission to go and investigate some refugee who'd been found in the jungle covered in blood. Um, almost exactly like in the movie. You'd find this woman cowering in the undergrowth, covered in blood that wasn't hers, and she was babbling about the jungle came alive and took them. Exactly the way it happens in the movie. You'd then get a series of waypoints that you'd have to go and investigate, and once you get to these waypoints you'd find soldiers that had been skinned alive and strung up upside down in the trees, just exactly the way it happened in the movie. It did a very, very good job of building up the tension, and it used the Predator sound effects, it used the Predator music, you know, the, as, as far as setting the scene went, they did do a very, very good job, but when you actually came to fighting the Predator, it, it was kind of disappointing. Um, it was basically like playing whack-a-mole. The Predator had a metric shit ton of hit points. You could, you could run out of ammunition <laughs> shooting this thing before it died. Um, there was an ammo resupply point in the middle of the mission area, and they needed to be, because I did run out of ammunition several times while trying to fight this thing. And the way it would work is the Predator is obviously stealth, because it's a Predator. But I thought to myself, ah, the Predator has heat vision, doesn't it? But I also have thermal vision, so I can spot the Predator using my thermal vision. This will be easy. Nope, doesn't work. For some strange reason, game balance reasons, basically, thermal vision doesn't work on the Predator. So, what would happen is the Predator is stealthed, and then it would unstealth and shoot at one of you. And you'd have a couple of seconds, when it was unstealthed, to just pump as much lead into the Predator as you possibly could. And then it would stealth up again, and you'd, you'd, you'd erase a fraction of its invisible health bar, so you would have no idea how much damage you were actually doing to it. It would stealth up again, 
and then it would relocate, usually to the opposite side of the mission area, unstealth, shoot at one of you, you'd unload into it, and then it would stealth. And it would just do this over and over and over and over. It was really boring. And there was just no way I was ever going to get to make a video of it. Which was kind of disappointing. Because the build-up to it was fantastic. But the actual execution of the fight with the Predator itself? Not so much. Speaking of Ghost Recon Wildlands, I got a message over Christmas from somebody who just gave their name as Steve. You'll know who you are when I read the message out. He had this to say. I've watched the Ghost Recon series as you posted them and thoroughly enjoyed them, so during the Christmas break I was watching the last one you'd posted that I'd somehow missed. After watching it, I decided to check the Steam store again, and it was 50% off on the Christmas sale. A bargain at $29.99. So he had a week and a half off work, time to burn, so he figured, oh, what's the worst thing that could happen? <laughs> a week and a half later, he's back at work and he's completely exhausted. He played most days for six to eight hours. I don't know how you feel. I was exactly the same when I first got that game. Uh, he even pulled a couple of all-dayers. Yes, 24-hour Ghost Recon sessions. The missions are addictive and very frustrating sometimes. And he went on to give one example. When he was capturing El Cardinal. I remember that mission. It could be very frustrating. Um, Steve went for the stealth approach and he cleared the whole area around the church, including a 304 meter snipe with a silenced M40A5. He managed to get into the church, plant the evidence and kill the guards, and then El Cardinal made a run for it. He grabbed a car and gave chase. Completely unopposed of course, because he killed everybody inside the area before actually making the, the run to grab El Cardinal. A couple of kilometers down the road, he manages to bring his car to a stop. El Cardinal gets out and quickly drops to his knees with his hands on his head. In the middle of the road. Gets hit by a truck and killed. Mission failed. <laughs> Ghost Recon players right now are going, yep. <laughs> yep, I've had that happen before. And yes, I have also had that happen before. Intensely frustrating, but it's still a great game nonetheless. The next message I wanted to read out, I'm going to have to speak very slowly and clearly for the benefit of the person that wrote this message, because he's a Spanish speaker. English isn't his native language. He said, Hello, I joined today in your YouTube channel. Initially, I watched only World of Warships, then some others. Related to World of Warships, you are an excellent expert. I'm not. <laughs> I'm okay. Um, I never played that game, but probably will in the near future, following your advice. By the way, I find it hard to understand your English accent, so I have to play and replay your videos very often. My mother tongue is Spanish. Thank you for such a good explanations in your videos. Yours, Velasquez. I get a lot of messages like that. Um, Velasquez, thank you very, very much for your message. Thank you for subscribing, and I'm very, very happy that you're enjoying the content that I put up on YouTube. I hope I don't disappoint you in the future. I got another message here from Pirate Captain Seb. Uh, he submitted a couple of replays, which I'm going to take a look at right after I finish doing this video. Um, but he also had this to say at the end. I very much hope you all had a marvellous Christmas, a stellar new year, and all the best in 2018. I'd also like to thank you, sir, for introducing me to several games. Don't call me sir, I work for a living. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's a Navy thing. Um, World of Warships and Cold Waters being the most notable, and the two that have very much eaten up most of my time. Mainly though, I need to thank you for publishing videos pretty much six days a week without fail. Knowing vaguely what time of day a Jingles video would appear, and knowing that it would almost certainly be there, helped me to get up out of bed and help me start my day in the best of ways, and in a lot of ways carried me through the loss of my father in June. Without such regularity, a clock by which to kickstart each day, I'm genuinely not sure I would have held it all together. Thank you, sir, for being who you are and doing what you do. Respectfully and thankfully, yours, Pirate Captain Seb. Seb, uh, please accept my commiserations on the loss of your father. Um, thankfully, I don't know what that's like. Um, obviously, at some point I will, but hopefully not for a few years yet. Uh, and thank you very much for your message. You're incredibly welcome. Uh, I really do enjoy doing what I do, and I'm just grateful that so many other people enjoy it. Finally, there was one other message that I received of the hundreds over the last couple of weeks that really did spark my interest. The title of the message was HMS Kelly, what would she be like in World of Warships? This was from somebody calling themselves Sentinel. He said, Hi Jingles, 
Seeing as we've had HMS Gallant in World of Warships for a little while now, I got thinking about what the other destroyers might be like. Um, British destroyers are going to be coming. This is this is me, by the way. This isn't what Sentinel had to say. British destroyers are going to be coming. Um, I guarantee you that, although not for a while. First, we've got the American cruiser rebalance. But there were so many destroyers and different classes of destroyers that Britain built between the First and Second World Wars that, that wargaming are going to be spoilt for choice when it comes to British destroyers. Um, and it's going to be a question of what they leave out rather than what they include. But like myself, Sentinel very, very much hopes that the British K-class destroyers are included, potentially at Tier 8. Uh, and hopefully, and I definitely agree with him, the British destroyer, assuming that K-class do make it into the game at Tier 8, the ship chosen to represent the K-class destroyers, hopefully, is going to be HMS Kelly. I definitely agree with Sentinel on this, and the reasons Sentinel gave were quite personal, because HMS Kelly was built at the shipyards on the River Tyne at Hebben in County Durham, so his hometown. And that's very, very close to my hometown as well. But my reasons for really, really wanting to see HMS Kelly in the game is because, well, the real HMS Kelly was a K-class destroyer, and it was sunk in 1941 by air attack while evacuating troops from Crete. She actually managed to shoot down three of the four Stukas that were attacking her, and damaged the fourth one so badly that it crashed upon returning to its airbase, but the ship was sunk by dive bombers with the loss of about half of its crew. The commanding officer of HMS Kelly at the time was Lord Louis Mountbatten, who would later go on to become Supreme Commander, Allied Forces Southeast Asia. Now, when I first joined the Royal Navy, I joined as a radio operator, and the communications training school for the Royal Navy was at a place called HMS Mercury in Hampshire. HMS Mercury has been closed down for years, and all communications training has been moved to HMS Collingwood in Fareham, but the communications training squadron for new recruits at HMS Mercury was called Kelly Squadron, and it still bears that name at HMS Collingwood. The reason it's called Kelly Squadron is all because of Lord Louis Mountbatten. As a young naval officer who was very interested in communications technology, in 1924 he joined the Portsmouth Signal School. In 1926 he was the assistant fleet wireless and signals officer of the Mediterranean fleet, after promotion to Lieutenant Commander, he returned to the Signal School as the Senior Wireless Instructor, and he was then appointed Fleet Wireless Officer to the Mediterranean Fleet, and then after being promoted to Commander, was assigned to the battleship HMS Resolution as the Executive Officer. In 1937, he was promoted to Captain and put in command of the destroyer HMS Kelly. And thanks to his long association with communications, and his command of the destroyer HMS Kelly, that is why the Royal Naval Signals Training Squadron for new recruits has since been called Kelly Squadron. It's also always been associated with the HMS Kelly Survivors Association. Remember when the ship was sunk in 1941, half of the crew went down with her. And when I was in training as a communications specialist in the Royal Navy in 1989, shortly before Christmas of that year, I was selected along with a bunch of other trainees to go to the Mountbatten Hotel in London as a guest of Lord Mountbatten's daughter, who was the patron of the HMS Kelly Survivors Association. And every year she would host the Survivors Association annual reunion at the Mountbatten Hotel. And this was the first time I'd ever had the opportunity to speak to a World War II veteran. And it had a huge impact on me. Sadly, there weren't too many of them left. I think at the time there were only 12, and in 2011, the last survivor died. His name was Harry Tomlinson, and he died aged 91. But I met him that day in 1989 at the reunion, and it was a huge privilege for me. And so it, it's, it's for this reason that I, I sincerely hope that the K-class destroyers do make it into World of Warships. And if they do, I hope the ship chosen to represent those K-class destroyers, like the Sentinel, who sent me the message that sparked my whole interest in this thing all over again. I really do hope that that ship is HMS Kelly. And that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, the first of 2018. Thank you to everybody who sent me messages over the Christmas break. Thank you to everybody who sent me gift boxes in World of Warships over the Christmas break. Thanks to you lot. I've got the USS Missouri at last. Um, 
and thank you of course to everybody who continues to support me on Patreon. Remember Mingles with Jingles is advert free and that's down to the Patreon subscribers. So if you've enjoyed your advert free Mingles with Jingles experience then leave a thank you to the Patreon supporters down below in the comments as well because it's basically all because of them. Although to be completely honest even if this video had been monetized I have absolutely no doubt that YouTube would have jumped all over it and demonetized it as being not suitable for advertisers <laughs> because you know I talk about war and things um, it's still going on by the way you know I mean the, the worst is definitely behind us but the adpocalypse is still going on about a couple of videos this week have been demonetized within a couple of hours of uploading them but you know what what you're gonna do <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> Incidentally, I got a Christmas gift from my YouTube partner network, which was quite amusing. They sent me a sweater, and it says, We think you're advertiser-friendly. <laughs> so, anyway, um, at least they had a sense of humour about it. So, anyway, yes, that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.